Welcome to our third symposium on AI, conversations on AI here at the uh, newly minted Canisius University. Um, we've had two previous lively discussions with some of you who participated in, and I anticipate uh, we're on track for another one. This event is hosted by the Canisius AI and Society Initiative. An initiative is a fancy way, and the higher ed means bunch of people are interested in something, <laughs> so we better do something. Yeah. And so that's where we are right now. It's a partnership uh, of the Canisius Center for Analytics and Data Ecosystems, CCADE. Uh, Professor David Sheets is the director. Um, the Canisius Writing Center, uh, led by Graham Stowe. Um, the Canisius School of Education and Human Services, uh, Dean Nancy Wallace and my office, the Center for Online Learning and Innovation, and a lot of other sort of partners on campus. It's sort of a, a gathering uh, uh, folks that are interested. Um, and I'm, I'm going to start just by pointing out, I, I shared to all who RSVP'd, and I can share to anyone besides, uh, which you give me your email address, a Google Drive folder, which contains right now a Google Doc with two links. One is to the AI and Society Initiative website, and we have our own guide for our faculty if you're interested in looking at that. And another one, um, one of our panelists, uh, panelists uh, Robin Sullivan, has developed a resource as part of her MTech project. Uh, I, am, I am an alumnus of her MTech MOOC. It's a great, great program. Mm. And um, anyway, uh, I, I think I'm going to start the conversation by asking our panelists to introduce themselves and how they came by AI, or perhaps it came looking for them. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I'll start with you, Robin. And if you want to sure. uh, touch upon this resource, that'd be great, because I think, okay. our, I think uh, our, our attendees would be interested. Sounds great. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much for hosting this event and inviting me to be a part of it. It's a great opportunity to uh, talk to all of you about some exciting changes that we all have to think through. And so my name is Robin Sullivan, and if you, I'm an instructional designer. My title at the University of Buffalo is teaching and learning strategist. So it's just some fancy words that mean that I assist faculty and students and staff at the University of Buffalo and beyond to integrate emerging technologies or technologies of any sort into their teaching and learning and research processes. Um, I have uh, another hat that um, I am the director of this, uh, for short we call it MTech. The really long title is Exploring Emerging Technologies for Lifelong Learning and Success. And that's kind of the heart of my philosophy. If we can help um, it, learners and instructors and society to become lifelong learners, to be able to figure out what it is that their goal is, what are their objectives, and then determine are there any tools that will help them meet those needs, that's um, kind of the best thing. If we can, instead of saying here is what you're going to use and you know we will never change from that, mm -hmm. being able to say this is some of those millions of tools that are available at our disposal, but I need, I need to get these skills so that I can um, find what I need, make sure that it is useful, make sure that it is safe and secure for my use. Um, so one of the, I think the introduction of artificial intelligence, the version that we're getting exposed to now, is kind of driving that point home. We, it's pretty difficult for universities and schools and districts and whoever to keep up with the latest and greatest. So we need to be able to work together, be you know, collaborative with our learners to determine, you know, is this something that is going to meet the needs? And AI is one of those categories. So if you go to this site, you can go to the Discover menu and it will have a wiki collection. A wiki just means that people can add to this collection, and I hope you all do. Um, it started with about 150 resources. We now have close to 600. And AI is one of the very newest categories. We, um, we had um, uh, you know, many categories like photo and video, presentations, productivity. AI is now its own brand new category. 
Um, so many of the resources we might mention might be there already. I'm trying to kind of keep it curated so only putting the best of the best up there. Um, but that's kind of my passion, helping people move and understand what's the best technology for their use. And AI is just one more new tool that we have to learn about and understand the benefits and the implications for its use. Um, just one more quick sentence about this. This is tied to a Coursera-based MOOC. And a MOOC is just a fancy word for an online course. It's freely available for anybody in the world to take part in. Uh, but then if you have, you know, if you're alumni somehow of the SUNY system, you'll be able to get one of the Coursera-based certificates for your um, resume and CV. Um, and it's targeted to college students on up. So you don't have to be in academia. It could be just a person of, um, you know, within society looking to improve their skills. Um, but it could also be used for high school students. You know, if you bring it down a little bit. Can we get CTLE hours for that? Um, we are working on that as <laughs> oh, yeah? the CTLE credit <laughs> um, in addition, yeah. So okay. if anybody has okay. any ways to help us with that, check me out. Cool. Um, thank you so much, uh, first of all, for inviting me here. It's great to engage in these conversations, um, not just scroll Twitter and see, you know, who's saying what, which is my mm -hmm. general mode of finding out about this kind of stuff and interacting, um, for, for better or worse. Um, my name is Colin Debkowski. I'm an English teacher at Alden High School. Going into my third year of teaching there, I teach um, mostly senior English. Uh, and I also teach a couple of electives, uh, multimedia production, and acting class, and creative writing. And we, in all of those classes, when ChatGPT dropped last year, um, last school year, um, we have been kind of exploring around the edges of what is this and what does it mean. Uh, my students have been, uh, on the one hand, very excited and embracing this sort of new possibilities that this offers. And on the other hand, as I was saying to Mark earlier, some of them have rejected it because it doesn't really fit the box of what they think education is. They, they may see it as a, as a cheat. Um, and they have a hard time reconceptualizing, well, what is education? And I think, to me, that is the great thing about, it, about these AI tools. They're forcing us to question what, what the heck we're doing here. Um, a lot of our traditional education system um, is, you know, not working anymore. We're still in the 19th century model in, in high schools, and we still have bells that ring like factory bells to get us from one place to the next, and we still are pumping out kids like they're some sort of commodity. But, um, and so what I've been exploring just very tangentially in my classrooms has been like how can we help this how can this tool help us re-envision what our job is as educators and what our job is as students and what was the task of education is it fitting into a box or is it um is it something we haven't conceptualized yet is it you know public facing projects uh, you know is it journalism is one of the things that, that i teach um I know it's not five paragraph essays that ChatGPT can write. Mm -hmm. So, but with that being said, like I don't want to gobble up all the time, um, but I'm just excited to be here and to keep talking about these issues. So, I'm excited to be here too, listening to Robin and Colin. This is, this is a lot and it's exciting to share this panel with you and I'm glad that we're in a smaller space, not too many people, because it's a more intimate setting, right? We can have more discussion. And so when I got the email from Meg, I was very honored to um, be asked to come sit on this panel. But my name is uh, Dr. Darren Brown Hall. I'm the superintendent of the Williamsville Central School District. And as you can imagine, um, Chat P Chat GPT came looking for us, right? <laughs> so we did not have the luxury of sitting around waiting to try to figure out what it was. So when your students start using a tool like this, you have no choice but to really try to understand it and see how it can better enhance the educational experience they're having and how it can better support teachers in the classroom. But it goes back to what you were saying, Colin, re-examining education to really understand what we're actually teaching students in school 
the why and how we're trying to figure out what they know and are able to do, right? And so those are the conversations we have to have in how anything that is new can advance that, right? And so that's exactly what, what I'm hoping we'll discuss today and have a lot of interaction, a lot of discussion with that. Okay, I mean, so generally uh, the way this conversation often goes next is benefits, drawbacks, and I, I guess we'll, we'll go that way. Um, we'll start with benefits. Um, so, okay, acknowledging that there's a lot of, you know, like Twitter and, and other social media, there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, doubt about these things in education. But where are we at least tentatively optimistic about where AI might benefit students and also, and also benefit our, frankly, overworked teaching staff? It, do you mind if I start? Please. So it, it starts, I'm looking at you because you asked a question, but I'm going to look at you all. It starts the conversation, right? So when we talk about teachers in the classroom having to differentiate instruction, we've talked about it for many, many years. We've seen it done sometimes. We haven't seen it done all the times. So when we have teachers designing lessons and they can then use chat GPT to figure out what might be some areas or ways I can differentiate this lesson for the benefit of my students, right? How can I know what level my students are at and I'm taking quadratic equations, right? I'm just saying that because you're here, Dr. Cobb, right I'm taking quadratic equations, but I know that I have students that struggle, right, with algebra. I have students who are at the intermediate level with algebra, and I have students who are at the advanced level with algebra. So how do I find the onboarding and then the landing page for each of these groups of students? Chat GPT can do that. So that's where you see the benefit at, the differentiation that teachers can use in the classroom, but it's also going to be a great tool for students. We know many times that in school, teachers think, or the way they've been educated to think about teaching is to help students find the answer, right? That is the old model of education, the old model of teaching. We have to be teaching students how to problem solve and how to think, right? It goes back to the Dr. Seuss book, Hooray for Different Do for Day. Did anyone ever read that book? It's a phenomenal book, and I use it a lot when I'm talking in speeches. Okay, so just a side note, because <laughs> I love the book. But there's a part of the book where students, if they don't pass this test and get all the right answers, they will be sent to schooling in Flobbertown, right? And they want to stay, you know, here with Mrs. Bonkers, their teacher. And it's the day of the test. The kids come in, and they're really, really upset. They're really, really anxious and nervous. And Miss Bonkers is the teacher. And the passage goes, Miss Bonkers rose. Don't fret, she said. You have the things you need to pass this test and many more. I'm certain you'll succeed. We've taught you that the earth is round and red and white make pink. But just one thing that matters most, we taught you how to think. So if we stop trying to teach students to find the answer and to teach them how to think and to problem solve, check GPT, is, it falls right out of the equation, right? Because then students will know they're thinking for themselves. Now, they may use chat GPT to, to have a prompt, right, when they're writing an essay. They may use it to actually ask a question that they're afraid to ask in class, right? We have to start looking at the positive ways that we can shape education for our students and make sure that they're utilizing it in the proper way and being able to think for themselves. So it's two things that we're trying to accomplish. Okay, I've talked enough. I'm sorry. No, I mean the Dr. Seuss. I I, I don't know how to follow that. No. I didn't memorize any Dr. Seuss today, but um, like they're so it's we're in such uncharted territory, and I think that it's be premature to say these are the benefits and these are the drawbacks. So what I, from what I've seen, like. Um, the, the the biggest benefit is that it's like a it's fuel for uh, students' curiosity. I think that the, it acts as a way, as as something for them to bounce ideas off of and help them refine and develop their ideas into something um, perhaps better articulated than they were at the outset. But it doesn't give them an idea. It takes an idea and helps them kind of craft it into. Um, into something that could then be propagated, or it can then be turned into a project, or I don't know, could then be plugged into Python and could create some 
some amazing computer program. So I think there, the, the benefits of it were just starting to, to learn. Um, for teachers, like I love the differentiation idea. I'm always doing peer review, and there's always, you know, those groups where they're not really peer reviewing. Right. And like, <laughs> if I had the option of like sending the enthusiastic kid to Chat TBT to get their peer review, it's a computer, but I mean, they they ask good questions. I've I've sometimes fed it articles that I write, you awesome. know, um, and I'll ask it what's you know missing right. from this article, and it'll, it's quite good at saying, well, here's some holes for you mm -hmm. to fill in. So I think if we can use it that way, um, it helps. But I think the biggest benefit is, as I kind of reference, is helping us like re-envision the activities that we're having our students engage in. And um, if it's not really led by their curiosity and it's not somehow tied to the real world, at least at the secondary level, at the especially seniors in high school, if it's not a real project that does not have an audience other than me, mm -hmm. then that's a problem. Um, because you can cheat on that kind of project. You can't cheat on a real world project. Um, I think if we, if we embrace that sort of new mode of education, uh, project based learning, what, call it what you will, mm -hmm. has a lot of different names, inquiry, we call it in English teaching, um, then I think that that's the biggest benefit. The drawback, I guess, is we still work within this system of sta standardized testing. Um, where it is find the answers. I just had to tutor a bunch of kids to pass the 11th grade regents, um, which was like pulling teeth, but they all passed with 65 or better. So I feel like good about that, but mm -hmm. I don't feel good that we have to still do this like ridiculous exercise. Right. And like here's the, you know, the answer is hidden here and they're trying to trick you out of what little you know. Mm -hmm. Like instead of leading students on their own path that they've set and we can use the tools at our disposal, like mm -hmm. only one of which is AI, to help them figure out how to navigate that path. So I don't know. I'm I'm optimistic. I would say about the the way things are going, and the drawbacks are the same drawbacks. Like kids are going to cheat. Like bad things are going to happen. Like you have to be always on the lookout for that as an educator. But I don't think it's anything different than mm -hmm. what they would have done before. You know. Um. So. Great points, and um, you know, I guess two keywords I want to kind of pull out from what you both replied um, is just talking about the ability to personalize learning, mm -hmm. and um, you know to give them real activities and authentic right. activities to help them learn and to help them assess whether or not they're understanding whatever the goal is. Um, if I could, you know, just first take back, take us back a little bit. Um, AI is not brand new. You know, artificial intelligence has been around for many, many years in different forms. Um, you know, just you know, finding you know from point A to point B. It's using artificial intelligence to figure out what's the best route. Your little um, word processing is you're you know writing out a statement and you use grammar check. That's artificial intelligence trying to figure out what's the you know better way to say this. Um, so when we moved from you know using uh, you, you know just math without the use of a calculator tool, um, that was moving us in a technological direction to help. Um, and people were very concerned at that time. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, students are not going to use math. They're going to use these calculators and they're going to cheat and they're not going to know what to do. Well, they've been around for a long time, and we now know that. If we can help the learner understand the process, um, how to get through that math equation, um, they can learn and get through it. And so, in a way, I see the the new version of artificial intelligence. And what's new about it? Um, it's the word generative that they put in it. They call it generative artificial intelligence. Um, the GPT is you know that's it's generating something as a result of what is being input. Um, so we have to learn how to do this prompt writing or prompt engineering as they call it to get the AI to generate something for us, whether it's a sentence, an essay, a map, uh, on and on we can, we can go. Um, it's, we were all very concerned when Google was around and uh, the librarians were very up in arms. Oh my goodness, they're not gonna use our databases of scholarly <laughs> materials and students are learning to use Google Scholar in ways that 
rival some of the um, databases and the processes. But we still need to give them that library instruction on how to ask good questions right, right. to get the proper response that they're looking for. And even if they do get the five paragraph essay out of that prompt, we need to teach them that it's just one step in the process and you need to be able to take what it gave you, validate that all of it is accurate. It's, it's a big thing with the, um, the recent changes and keep working at it. Even just before generative AI, we would write, but that was just a process. You can look at manuscripts by authors and they're crossing out and changing things all over the place. They're not just writing it and done. It's step one of a process and we need to teach them how to do that. And that, that goes back to their understanding, right? Yes. So it goes back to making sure students, when they're reading whatever, is produced to make sure they have an understanding of it. And so, because chat GPT can be wrong, right? And we wanna make sure yeah. we stress that. And that's one of the drawbacks, right? We wanna make sure we stress that. And it um, actually came up in church. So, Pastor Spillman used chat GPT to write his sermon a few weeks ago, right? He's one of the interim pastors at uh, Lutheran Church of Our Savior, where I go, it's right over here on Brunswick. And he did it because his son-in-law was visiting and his son-in-law is an engineer that works with chat GPT. He said he wanted to experiment. So he said he had chat GPT, he you know, put in the prompt, it wrote the sermon, but he said he found so many inaccuracies, so many biblical references that were inaccurate. And if he did not know that, right, he could have got up in front of the congregation and we'd all be like, what? <laughs> this, this is not accurate, Pastor, right? So he had to know the, what the, the basic um, concepts and the basic scriptures were just so that it was accurate and he had to edit it, right? So that's why we need to stress to our students, you just can't trust it blindly, mm -hmm. right? They, they still need to know and understand and be able to do on their own so that they're able to edit what is given to them. Okay. So this is this, you know, hallucination is one potential drawback and I'm gonna be up here in this very classroom a week from Thursday showing students examples of hallucination as a historian, um, mm -hmm. you know, to, to try to, you know, illuminate that problem. I, I think we're concerned with it on, on a couple of, of, of levels. Um, since we have two K-12 educators in the panel, I'm curious as to what kind of interactions you've had with parents about this. Mm -hmm. uh, Josh, you mentioned last week that that was sort of a, a prime mover for, for your school system to start thinking, okay, this AI thinks <laughs> it's a big deal. And so I was curious if you if you know of or had any interactions with parents or concerns parents have raised or do you anticipate concerns? Oh, a absolutely, <laughs> especially when you have uh, very competitive students and competitive parents when you're talking about academics, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's where it's going to really um, show that we have to be on top of and, you know, and we're looking at AI meets AI, right? So artificial intelligence meets academic integrity and what that looks like. Mm -hmm. and, and parents want to know what that's going to look like because they want to make sure that their students or their kids aren't, you know, number one, um, a, a victim of plagiarism. Number two, that they're not going to be disqualified for any scholarships if they use AI. So there's a list of things that we have to consider that parents have asked us. And I know that the assistant superintendents through BOCES, uh, assistant superintendents of curriculum and instruction are having these conversations in order to update their academic integrity policies. Parents are very big on that because they want to support their students, as all parents do, right? When you know better, you do better. So they want to support their students in the best way possible. So that's why parents want to know and be on top of it. So even more so when we pass out syllabus or syllabi at the beginning of the school year, you know, parents want to see those also. And so they're having additional questions about AI. So we have to answer that. But we are still in stage one. Yeah of what NISBA describes. And they had a paper, I didn't go to the conference, but it's the Leadership Toolkit for Generative AI for District and School Leaders. It's a pre-release copy. But there's five phases of um, the Ed Advanced Framework, and phase one is educating. So we're still in that phase right now, educating teachers, parents, the community, and the cabinet members about what AI is, how it can be used in an educational setting, and please don't jump to the fact that, or the thought that 
if students are using generative AI that they're cheating, right? right. We want to get away from that idea also. So th those are some of the things that we're going to start having our in-depth conversations about, but then also taking it a step further and how can we then generate or develop courses so that our students can be on top of these new technologies, right? And so those are some of the conversations we're having with Dr. Joaquin Carbonara about how we can look at computer science and digital analytics um, in the high school setting so that our students are leaving high school, taking these electives, and being even more advanced in their studies. So I would say I've had limited interactions with parents. Um, about ChatGPT because I haven't really used it in a sort of formalized way in my classes, just an exploratory way. I will say the, the first class I introduced it to was a College English 12 class that I teach for college credit through ECC, um, and I got a very negative reaction from the students. Um, there are many, most of them college bound, and their goal out to get out of my class was they needed to know how to write that academic paper, still required for, for college. Um, and that was their goal number one. Um, so they didn't want to mess around with AI. They didn't. They weren't interested in like learning about these new technologies. And many of them saw me teaching it as sort of an affront to like the system that they had grown up with, the mm -hmm. education system mm -hmm. that they had become used to. And I could say I understood their point because they'll be coming to school. I assume you probably still have your kids write papers. Maybe. Um, <laughs> Is that no, a bad no, assumption? I, for other reasons, but even prior to the AI. I sort of abandoned the term paper. Yeah, but okay. good. Thank Monster. God. No, I got rid of that. Uh, I, ha I am, the class I'm about to teach is different from the one I taught prior to the AI. Yeah. Uh, prior to AI. Good, that's that, great. I've got them, um, I've got them refocused on course readings, and I'm going to try out having them annotate. Use, uh, hypothesis is the tool set. But there's right. perusal is another one. You can get these. To, I want to teach them annotation and sort of note taking in, in where it intersects with his, historical thinking, mm -hmm. ways to interrogate a narrative right. as a historian does, alongside you know my colleagues in philosophy. They have ways they they say to students interrogate it, you know interrogate yeah. what you're being presented as a story. Mm -hmm. um, speaking as a as a as a professor in the trenches, I guess. Um, I, I am both terrified by this and the prospect of teaching with it. I also have a sneaking suspicion that, as this panel has suggested, we're going to come out of this teaching much, much better than we did. And I think that's great. You, to your yeah. point, it's not working. Um, well, I, I think that's probably true in some respects. And I think, in any event, even if it was semi working or working, we can do better in the AI as sort of rung the bell. Yeah, we've got to pay attention. To I totally right. agree with that. It's right. just the, the 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 response I have been getting limited though has been from parents is just, you know, a fear of change really. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's healthy in some respects. As educators, we have to also educate parents, educate the community, educate Absolutely. our administrators sometimes, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> about what the potential is for these Absolutely. tools. And I just like, I come back to this, this idea of, in, of interrogating a historical narrative, of interrogating whatever, um, and we look at the research and for, for decades it has shown that like when students create good questions, that is the precursor to great conversation and deep learning. So a student's ability to create an excellent question um, or to create a question that prompts a response from someone else right. or helps you delve deeper right. in your thinking is like we, in the literature over and over again proves to be what is one of the many tools that are successful, at least in the English classroom and, and lots of classrooms. So it just dovetails really well with like the new skill that we need to teach them is like how to ask a, how to write a good prompt. It's the same as asking a good, you know, generative question in a Socratic seminar. Mm -hmm. So I think like there are affinities that with what we already do, the good parts of what we already do, and then there's a whole other universe of, of new things we could be doing too, so it's really exciting. Yeah. Um, also, I just want to, I guess, um, you know, another new function of this artificial intelligence process is that it is um, very much like a conversation. So being able to have a conversation with the search and with the um, the prompt that you're asking. So you ask 
uh, portion of the question. But if you can give it as many details as possible, that helps to give you a better answer. And by um, also asking for additional details that will also allow you to um, personalize that learning a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So if one student is advanced and you know ready to go to the next level, using some of these AI tools, you can kind of shape the learning task in front of them to their level. So if they're at a much lower level, you can make the questions lower level understanding. And if they are at a very um, advanced level, you can push them even further. Um, so, you know, I... How awesome is that, right? That is. That, that is, That's I the think differentiation great. we can do in real time, mm -hmm. right? How awesome. Yes. And just being able to, um, you know, have that collaborative learning experience, yeah. they're collaborating with an AI engine. And hopefully they're using that that skill of questioning to question mm -hmm. the AI. Yes. Because, I mean, one of the huge drawbacks is who owns the information, mm -hmm. what are they doing with the information, and this, like, potential development of a feedback loop, say that Google is backgrounded already, you know, all mm -hmm. the search engines have AI components, and we're, so our balkanized media landscape is, like, even more so, mm -hmm. and our tunnel vision is even more mm -hmm. so. And so that's a huge danger. But hopefully if we approach it with this idea of, like, developing those the skills of inquiry, like we will also be, you know, holding the systems to a higher standard too, because right. it's, it's sort of, you know, uh, disturbing the way you know OpenAI runs its business and doesn't disclose certain things, and so it's not all sunshine and rainbows by any stretch. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah the drawback. Uh, yeah, yeah, big drawback. Right. It, it's a dilemma for me because I can say to my students, experiment with the AIs, but then. You know, immediately I sort of draw back and say, but, you know, maybe create a throwaway email account. Be very careful not to provide, you know, per personal details or things like that. Because mm -hmm. I, it's not that I suspect immediately that Anthropic or, or OpenAI might have nefarious purposes or they could fall victim to a hack. Right. They could Absolutely. have data that's taken out of their system. Uh, or I... I just don't, I, I want to cultivate among my students a, a habit of mind of being safe on the internet. And, I, and, and when there aren't very clear terms of service, then that's usually where I would say to my students, be on guard, be careful about your information. Uh, I, uh, Robin, you're, you're in a somewhat similar situation. I, 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 my day job is helping mm -hmm. faculty use the internet. Um, that's, that's my dinner party explanation. And uh, <laughs> it's, um, so, so what concerns are faculty bringing to you and what are your sort of ways to get them started in a productive way to, okay, take a deep breath, here's your next steps with regard to AI in this semester that's coming. So yes, there are many that have concerns. Uh, many faculty are, um, often the very first thing that comes to mind is they are concerned that students will use this technology to cheat. And it's very likely. Um, I have seen, you know, some statistics that, um, you know, and I, you know, I need to go and actually drill down to find the, the citation for this. But they were saying something like last year, students um, reported that they used um, artificial intelligence to assist them with their homework, not to cheat, but to assist them with their homework. Um, for 75% was the response. Mm -hmm. And I have talked to faculty from last year who had to go through many very uncomfortable conversations with their department chairs and deans when students were determined that they were possibly using AI for their um, papers in ways that were not um, acceptable. So um, it's, it's uh, something to be concerned about. But if we learn how to steer the student's energy towards using it in a very ethical way, in that process-driven, um, you know, show your work, um, you know, don't show me the final essay that it's done, show me how you, you know, ha had the artificial intelligence come up, help you brainstorm ideas, and, um, you know, maybe it helped you rephrase some of these sentences. Where w where's your writing in there, and how are you changing that? Um, and yeah, I asked the faculty, how are they maybe rethinking their assignments to 
um, allow their students to have these important skills when they graduate, when they leave their classroom. We don't want them, you know, the, you know, the one of the worst approaches in my thought is to say, no, don't use this. It's not good. That's, you know, child psychology. Yes, I should. <laughs> um, so if we can teach them how to use it, there are so many options to use it in effective ways to mm -hmm. create writing, to create images, to create media. Um, to analyze data, to write programs. That's what we need to do. We need to teach them how to use it well so that when they do get into the workforce, they're able to use it intelligently instead of using it as something that they're using to get around the system. Um, I also try to point them to some of the resources that are being unveiled for faculty to help you design your courses so much better. Um, mm -hmm. I've been an instructional designer through the university for more than a few decades and the systems are showing me very good results. Um, there are, there's uh, one tool, it's called Knowledge, it's spelled N-O-L-J, I think, or E-J in there. Um, but it will, if you give it some of your course um, information, your syllabus, it will help you rewrite that. It will give you objectives that are very thought through. And they may not be perfect. Again, then there's that process. You can take what it's given and then make it even better or more custom to yourself. It will give you interactive uh, games, um, at, uh, dis deep level discussion prompts that you can use in your mm -hmm. classes and many other ways to improve your course. And so if you're using AI in intelligent ways, you're modeling practices to your students on how they can also use these as tools to get the job done. Right. But we don't want to be hypocrites either. You know, our teachers are like, well, they might use chat GPT. It's like, like you use Pinterest? Yeah, so. Yeah, don't exactly. Be, <laughs> don't be hypocritical. So you on Etsy. Absolutely, right? So it's just a matter of teaching the students. I like the way you put that. Thank you. I, um, Meg, I'll, 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 uh, we'll go with your question. I wanted to ask just real quick, uh, just because we've done this at every panel, it's been interesting. How many of you have an account with OpenAI and have used ChatGPT for something productive mm -hmm. instead of just sort of testing? Okay. And you tested it, though. A lot of you tested it. How many of you have a Claude to uh, Anthropic account? Okay. What is that? Uh, so Claude 2 is a competitor um, uh, AI, and it's, it appeared, it really sort of popularized only very recently during the summer. How does it spell? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, C L A U D E, I believe. Um, C L A U D E 2. 2, yeah. I, I, the, the number 2? Two? Two? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, Claude C L U D E 2. It's anthropic. If you go to anthropic.com, you'll find it. Oh, okay, anthropic. Okay. And yeah. also Bard. You guys don't like Bard, huh? Yes. Well, it doesn't seem like the internet likes yeah. Bard as much. That's right. I mean, that's, that's right. the way I would put it. Uh, I also have noticed, just as an aside, Bing Chat is theoretically powered by GP Chat GPT. Right. It seems to have a very different personality. Of course. Am I imagining that? No, no, he's right. It's connected yes. to the internet, which might explain. Yes. Yeah. It's um. A little more combative still, maybe? Yeah. It's pretty weird. But it also, yeah. I believe yeah. one of the background ideas is um, the dates. So GPT-3, the one, or, or 3.5, I think, is the one that's freely available. Um, and then I believe when you get into uh, GPT-4, then that's the model that you have to pay for. GPT-3.5, I believe the data stops at about 2021. Oh, both, of them do. both of them do. All of them do. Um, but does the Bing engine have a later? Um, it claims to be searching. And in my experiments, it was searching the internet up. It found an article, I think, a fairly recent article. Yes, yeah, so, so I kind of, I'm a very uh, devout Google user in many ways. But I have uh, downloaded the Microsoft Edge browser and you know tried to get into Bing just to compare the results of the um, different Mm. tools and so I am seeing differences and I kind of was thinking it was towards date and, and um, newer information if I wanted you know because if you want to ask anything about artificial intelligence what's use is asking anything to something that only goes till 2021 right, right. So if, if you look at chat 2 alone not the 
chat GPT, they, uh, GPT-2, I mean. Okay. And there is a, a whole bunch of uh, tweaks you can make. Warmer and uh, so that. Yeah. So there's something called temperature, and temperature. that, that kind of governs the randomness of the response. Exactly. Um, if you put your temperature very low, the response is going to almost be the same every time you give it the same prompt. Mm -hmm. The higher it introduces more elements of randomness. Which and creativity, is kind of, supposedly. You know, um, yeah. mm -hmm. Another thing too, like with the chat bots, Dan. Is this up there on the screen? Uh, I can. It's probably too complicated. Now, are school districts blocking ChatGPT? I think that you guys Some do that. So, so right now, we the IT department was working for guidance okay. on that, and so we have yet to. And part of this also is the positioning and the de the developing of what your academic integrity policies are going to be, right? So we have to make a decision very soon before school starts, because as you know, we're a one-to-one -one district, right? So we have to make that decision very soon. Mm -hmm. There are some teachers that do want students to have access to it, to use it, so it's very difficult, right? Even if you block it in school, students can use it at home. Yeah, it's not, nice, you know. So it's like, are you shooting yourself in the foot? Uh, they can use it a phone, too. Through the uh, well, we don't allow phones in class, oh. Dr. Carpenter. <laughs> so, <laughs> so no, that would not be something they can do. In class. In class. Yeah. Darren, my question to you is one around policy, and where you just said that your school is starting soon and you need to have a determination about student access. But where is your board, and where do you envision your board policy be in terms of the framework for the use of AI? And so I don't know that it will it will not reach the board level. It will not be board policy. It will more than likely be procedure right out of the superintendent's mm -hmm. office and out of the um, instructional curriculum department with Dr. Bailman. It will probably go that route. It will not reach board policy level because then it becomes very difficult to be nimble and try to adjust or change that. Mm -hmm. So it will more, more than likely be procedure and not policy. So as often as things change, we can adopt and adapt board um, procedure easier than board policy. And how do you do that? Do you do that largely through curriculum instruction? We do it largely through curriculum instruction. Absolutely. We you know, have a team of teachers, administrators, and because it's very rare that we make decisions of that magnitude by ourselves, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so we will develop a committee. And I know Dr. Bell has been having discussions with her directors and supervisors also. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And one of the resources on the MTEC site is um, a collection of policies that have been developed through different universities um, and kind of faculty statements. And um, so it's a place to go and see what other people are, are doing. And it's across the board. But you know, in order to develop your own policy, mm -hmm. you want to see what other yeah. institutions Absolutely. are doing. For syllabus and writing for mm -hmm. faculty. And that's why so many of the assistant superintendents of curriculum instruction have been having those discussions through their IDAD meetings, right? Because mm -hmm. no one district wants to be an outlier because we know that parents practice practice comparative governance. Well, you know, Alden is doing it this way, Amherst is doing it that way. And so we want to make sure that we're having those similar conversations. Is UB working with the local BOCES to share this information? Because that's really the engine and the network that governs most of the school districts in this region? Well, this, the, the website that you saw, the yeah. MTEC, that's a public website available to anybody in the world. Um, so you can go there and, you know, share it. Um, I don't, I'm not familiar with who at UB is working with BOCES. I'm sure there are uh, many um, within our graduate school of education and elsewhere. Um, but specifically on this topic, I'm not aware. I know that they, they, they couldn't hire, they couldn't find, so they were trying to hire an AI in the education department, they couldn't find somebody. And they hired two linguists in the linguistic department that are experts in the LLM. Okay. They have a, a whole bunch of experts in the uh, engineering, computer science, they have self-driving cars, they have a ton of things going on. Mm -hmm. yeah, there, is a, there is a whole inner um, artificial intelligence and data science center that has recently established, and they had a really great series um, just about a month or so ago. I don't think they got their videos up online yet, but something that I would highly recommend to keep an eye out and try to find their YouTube channel and you know subscribe so that when they do get up there. Some of them have been very great from our um, Office of Academic Integrity, from some of our faculty who have been using it in the ways that we've been describing 
Um, so they're definitely thinking about it, but in specifics, I'm not sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, hi, uh, for those of you I don't know, if it, I haven't met, I'm Jonathan Lawrence, I teach here at Canisius. I, I guess the first question or thought I have is that, you know, we can talk about academic integrity and, you know, pretend that various detection things were working for plagiarism, but the reality is that turnitin.com may catch some things, but the student who's either really creative at paraphrasing or who has purchased from one of the sort of hidden paper mills, you're not gonna you're not gonna catch it if it was you know, if they paid someone outsourced someone else to write the paper completely. But I guess the bigger question is if these different AI tools are sort of competing and somebody's going to make money by sort of winning the race, I guess part of my question is whether we as educators and as content experts can sort of push and prompt them. So, you know, I know for instance, Mark, you demonstrated for us some things in the spring where, and I forget which tool, I think it was just ChatGPT, was, me was making up citations. And that was on NPR. You could pretty right. reliably get it to, to, to hallucinate, right. to simulate. It, it, and, to simulate. you know, of course, that's the risk as a teacher that student presents something that looks like it has citations. And unless I sit down and track it down every single one, which I'm frankly not inclined to do, a lot of work. It, it's going to be a lot of work. But I guess the flip side is if we, you know, is there a way to like flag and teach it, no, that's incorrect. Um, or if you know we happen to know it's other kinds of hallucinations, you know, it's saying that George Washington fought at Gettysburg, um, you know, that that we can also help push them and you know remind them that the the one that wins is going to be the one that is giving the most reliable information, you know, because I, I I mean I'm trying to think of a silly yet extreme example, I'm not going to trust. AI right now to tell me how to build a car that's actually going to run and not blow up. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to trust AI to um, give me a, instructions on how to prepare a complicated recipe that's not going to make me sick. And so I, I guess the question just is how how do how do we play the system back at them to help it move into a more useful direction? One strategy I'd recommend is um, ask your students to show their process. So in some of the tools, especially um, in a if they're using something like a Google document to create their um, essay, you want to be able to have them share their um, document so that you can see the history. So you can see it started out with five sentences. It now has a couple paragraphs. And have them be honest on where the um, AI, you can name those different versions right. and say this is my paste in of the AI and here's what I did to change it with my changes in there. And as far as the citations, um, ask your students to provide the electronic link on their citation. So they have to, if the system gave it something, they have to be able to go in and say, well, here's the paper that they're citing. Mm -hmm. And if it's mm -hmm. not linked, you know, why isn't it linked? So, um, so, you know, to, to go to the library catalog and, and find the link and, and give it that, I like that. Or Google Scholar yeah, and yeah. find it and, you know. I think ChatGPT will make up URLs. Yes. And so mm -hmm. you click them and it's a 404 error. Well, and usually now it's some sort of, you know, this link is broken kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Why does ChatGPT hallucinate? Why does it make up that stuff? I mean, really, I'm, that's a, that, to me, that's a good question. It, it, it's not hallucinating. That's just read a paper today that that's a wrong word. It's really not hallucinating. It, it, it generates words based on a probability distribution of the data. So it's simply that, you know, the more data you put, the, the more likely to give you the right information. But it just, but actually, uh, I don't know why we think that we humans don't lie or make mistakes. <laughs> Actually, there's a great story that, that, that a, a, a stuntman, a mathematician, did all the numbers, said, look, if you're going to jump from here, you're going to fall in this mattress, bounce, and you're going to be fine. He said, I don't think so. I don't trust this mathematician. Let's try a, a, put a, a sack of potatoes. They threw a potato, the thing ended up smashed itself, and 
became Smith and Higgs. I told you, <laughs> I cannot, humans cannot be trusted. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, so it's it simply, it, but if you think about it, we generate what we say word by word, and then mm -hmm. we correct ourselves as we go. Mm -hmm. So the process is, is really amazing, and, and, and you learn a lot by trying to compare yourself with ChatGPT. So it's simply the way it's built. It, it has, uh, it, it's very easy to find little examples. We could do a, a, uh, a hands-on workshop where people see work being generated in a simple case so that they get an idea of how it's done. It's not that complicated. Mm -hmm. But it's just that people don't have the, the experience of having seen these things done. The way I play because it's point. still new. It is new, mm -hmm. yeah. But anything new looks like magic. Mm -hmm. That's exactly where it comes from. <laughs> The way I explain, I plan on explaining it to my history students, uh, because I think they deserve an explanation, um, since one, mine is one form of knowledge that can appear if you ask ChatGPT these questions, um, is that it is built to simulate human beings, um, and it does so very well. And very often, it's what it's telling us corresponds to our truths. Um, occasionally, it's simulation does not, and that's not really a design requirement. So um, if I tell it I want a chief engineer for a starship in Star Trek, mm -hmm. pretend you are that, it will come up with very reliable science-y kinds of jargon. But just like uh, you know Montgomery Scott or uh, Geordi LaForge, it it will it, it's 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 actually just sort of maybe some of it's science babble, but you, you buy it because that's the story. It's, it's carrying the story. It's, it's a, these are compelling characters with compelling, compelling parts in the story. And so it's a simulator. Um, I am personally, I'm very interested to see if and how the hallucination problem can even be solved. And there seems to be some debate about that. And that is fascinating to me. I think it's a wonderful problem. Yeah, the hallucination right. problem. Yeah. One of the chat GPT prompts that you can do is uh, answer this question and provide facts and other sources yeah. to support what you are saying, to verify that it's true. So that's one technique, for instance. I've also heard if you say, uh, if you don't know, say you don't know. Exactly. Right. In other words, the supply say you do, you need not invent a plausible sounding thing in this case. <laughs> right. I haven't experimented with that enough to, to know, but but yeah, it's. Yeah. If you say let's take this step by step, it's like 30% more accurate or something like that. Right. Okay, so you, so you do a, what, what's the, what's that, you know, scaffold, prompt? Step Train step of thought, step T.O.T. Step by step. Okay. Yeah. If you Google T.O.T. Yeah, yeah. And then it, it changes the way it processes. But if you Google T.O.T. or train of thought, there are papers on it published uh, in the subject saying that it, it works better. Well, and I was going to say, in a, in a way, it's the same thing that you know it, someone mentioned. You know, just relying on Google search or a sloppy Google search is going to give you, you know, if you rely on a sloppy Google search and try to say, okay, I, I've done a quick search, I've found the information, some things maybe that's fine, but you know, I, I tell my share my students the example of one time finding something a website from the National Alliance. And it had information on the topic I was looking for, but I kept digging in the web page and found it was the National Alliance for the Preservation of the White Race. Oh dear. Which caused me to be very suspicious of anything they said. Right. Now, if I was a speechwriter for a politician and decided, okay, I found a web page that looks like it has the information, I'm gonna give it to them and say, yeah, you know, the National Alliance said this the other day, I would probably lose my job pretty of quickly. Course, of course. And so, you know, I, I tell them, you know, you you got to be careful and you got to fact check. And of course, this is the problem that things start to look like they're good. But I, I also I heard a speech um, at Chautauqua a couple weeks ago by Valhini Vara. She's a author, and she was saying that she was writing an essay about her sister's death and her grief, and she used ChatGPT. Sort of instead of you know as a write you know a living writing partner that she you know talked back and forth, just to sort of work through some things. And one of the you know funny kind of scary things that she came up with was that at one point, one of the versions it created was the idea that she start she went for a jog on the day of her sister's funeral, 
And she hasn't stopped jogging since, and in fact, she just ran a marathon. She said, none of that is true. But it's but, great, but right? It's brilliant, and, and yeah. it certainly reflects the assumptions or something that was out there in enough of people's stories about their grief that the search engine thought, well, hey, that this, you know, right. this is a plausible yeah. response. So I teach like creative writing, right? And we uh, we fed a bunch of poems into Mid Journey, and just cast kind of to see what would happen. We put together this literary journal, um, literary magazine or whatever. Got like a grant to do it. Um, it was cool, but didn't have we didn't have illustrations. So we're like, oh, maybe Mid Journey can do them. <laughs> the stuff that it spit out was amazing. So we just kept going with this project, and then they wrote poems, new poems based on what the Mid Journey spit. You know, when you make a Xerox and you Xerox it and Xerox it, it becomes crazy. So I don't know what the point of that is, other than it was really fun. And it, it, you know, like sometimes you need that weird friend who's gonna like spit back just batshit craziness. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and like, so uh, if you're not teaching some academic course, if you're teaching creative writing, or if you're, you know, running a theater department like I do, like you can get amazing ideas, and like the hallucinations then become a benefit. Um, you just have to like, it's all about the perspective you go at it with. Like, obviously, it's gonna be wrong. It's gonna lie, but it's also gonna be beautiful. And accidentally interesting, and all those things that humans are. Well, and I do not claim to have any artistic, you know, drawing skill. But if I wanted a picture just for fun of, you know, Jesus riding the back of a dinosaur or something <laughs> like that, these tools. Now, granted, I, I have great respect for artists to be aware of the copyright issues and intellectual property issues involved in there. But I, I can see interesting ways, and I um, also remember hearing an example. I, I saw somebody posting on it like six months ago. A rabbi who, sort of for fun, and I don't know if he decided not to publish it because I haven't heard anything since, but prompted it to prompted one of the tools to rewrite certain psalms in the voice of different. Poetic styles, like so, by Shakespeare, by Bob Dylan, by you know, beat poets or something like that. And you know, sure, you could sit down and spend six months writing that yourself, but it does create an interesting conversation to say, what would this sound like? Right. And then ask your students, how do they compare, and why do they differ, and you know, what can you identify in these? Exactly. I, I've asked ChatGBT to write Shakespearean sonnets selling toothpaste, and, mm -hmm. you know, cars and things like that. And it gives students a chance that, you know, you can say, okay, what is Shakespearean about this and what is not, you know? Or how does Madison Avenue work you know, and come up with some of the things they do come up with? Right, you know, and, I mean, you, you can learn from bad poetry, like that's, uh, yeah. as Douglas Adams teaches us. <laughs> but, um, so you might try this next week. Claude 2 will still do it. ChatGPT 3.5, I can't get it to do it anymore. Uh -huh. So I asked it to give me a biography of Dr. Mark Gallimore from Canisius University. The one thing correct here is that I am a historian by training. I was not here since 1990. I started in 2011. I do not have degrees from Johns Hopkins University or University of Florida. And probably the most, and I, I'm saying this to the camera, I'm not claiming any credentials. Okay, this is an example of hallucination. Um, I don't know whose book, Adams versus Jefferson, the tumultuous presidential election of 1800, <laughs> Kansas, Kansas University, Kansas Press. Sounds like a great book. If you're out there and you wrote this book, what a great book. Uh, I did not. So um, I am not a faculty advisor. So if you want to give students an example of hallucination, um, now ChatGPT, somebody told ChatGPT, you know, bad AI. Don't, don't fall for this. Stop letting people use this gag. You know, asking for a biography of themselves because now it will give you some. Well, I don't know. Oh, really? As if it's sort of, but Claude two will still do it. So that, if that's at all useful it, to come up with an example of hallucination, it may say a lot of wrong things. But have you ever seen any of these chat box give you something that is grammatically incorrect? No. no. That's what it does best. That's what it does. Yeah. That is what it is. Right. And the amazing thing is, how was it able to capture grammar without being told the rules of grammar? That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what machine learning is. It, it, it gets the input and the answer, and it tries to figure out the rules. Traditional programming, you have your input, you define all the rules, and you get your output. But so that, that's, oh, no, that's we, agree, we agree on that. But yeah. then, then I don't, people did not expect 
chat, ch chat bots to be this good. If when people wrote a paper in 2017, all you need is attention. That in order to generate things, the transform the T is for, for that paper. Transformer. Mm -hmm. They didn't expect that it was going to capture grammar this way. And actually, people that speak, uh, like Barry Smith, that speaks some, mm -hmm. I think, dialect. He, I went to one of his presentations. He says that this is not even as, as smart as a crawl, crawl in his driveway. <laughs> that this is not smart at all. He, that's his book. But in any case, for, for some languages where there is less literature, it's not as good. With it. But but you see, but, it, but it's not capturing rules, and that's why I keep saying that data science is going to do to science what science did to religion. That is, data science is able to figure out how to do things without having rules. But for the last 150 years, we've been bound by rules. rules. Yeah. That is, you have the second law of gravity, you have this, you have the other, and we follow rules. Mm -hmm. This follows. This learned from example. So we are teaching computers not what to do, but how to learn. So and, that. and yet in some literature and some writers and styles, the whole point is that they are breaking the rules. Exactly. And, and still get away with it. Mm -hmm. And that, that, there's a guy from MIT that just started a new uh, a, a movement called mechanistic interpretation. This is so, so wrong. This guy's going, he's trying to analyze ChatGPT the same way that neurologists analyze the brain. Say, okay, we're gonna come up with the rules to understand exactly how chat, how, how this chatbot works, which is exactly the, the, the opposite of what this is all about. But which mechanistic that, interpretation. That's what edu K through 12 education is, like especially in the lower grades. We're teaching you the rules to do the thing, and the thing that you have to do is write the paper to get to the college to do that. Right, it's right. So, you know, if students don't need to know, I mean, I don't know. We're, we're in envisioning like a crazy future. They obviously have to have a base of knowledge, but they get to a, some point in education where it's time to start doing things, mm -hmm. like real things. And I think that that's, that's what the, these tools kind of offer them the potential. Like, well, I don't know. I'm not the repository of knowledge. The teacher is no longer like the guy who knows, which is great for me because I don't really know too much. Not but a yeah, okay. right. Um, but like I, I'm excited for high school. I don't really know how K through six or whatever solves that because you still have to. You obviously have to teach like basic mathematics, writing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's so. Well, more more of it will be focused on instead of ask, asking what asking how and why mm -hmm. to really get to the thinking behind you know the, the thought is one thing but getting to the thinking behind the thought is really what we're going to be focused on when years to come in the board of regions you know mm -hmm. that's why they're they're looking at how we teach now right that's actually a perfect way to close this because that was a, just you hit the nail on the head with that comment i just have one question Every time I'm in this room, I'm so impressed by the intellect of people in this room and the level of knowledge that you have that is so far superior. And I think of people like me as um, is like an AI for dummies. So <laughs> one of the things I'm always interested in is how can we help educators acquire access to resources that meet them at the, their level of understanding? So if there is a, um, a, a research or a resource site to go to, that you can direct people Robin. that would be immeasurably helpful given the vagaries of competency that exist mm -hmm. from you know novices up through people like you in this room. Is there a place that, is this the site? I would you know point them okay. here as one little piece and, um, and the AI resources, right now there's only about 20 and there's 600 other topics in there. Um, but if they do want to start learning about AI, they can go in and just look at that category. And there are some of the more popular um, and used um, resources. But the two really big um, resources that I'm thinking of are still just uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of choices. And sometimes that's too much. It is too much. Um, but we are continually trying to improve this, and so I'm always looking for, you know, are there some resources for those that are just starting out? And if anybody here knows of them, please either go to the contribute menu and create an account and add it, or send me an email and just send me the link and I'll get it added. Awesome.
Well, folks, we are actually now 10 minutes over. This is what happened in the last ones. However, the conversation continues. Uh, there are some refreshments just down the hall in the, the faculty staff lounge. And we'll also then be joining uh, folks from the other, the uh, enterprise panel as well. And I would encourage you to maybe uh, find out what they've been what they've been discussing. I do want to thank our panel. Thank this you. is the worst time of the year to bring you away from your work. And yet you, you had some time to bring us your thoughts on AI. And this is fantastic. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.